Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, and uh, also uh, good day. Uh, I'm Henry Wang Hui, our founder and president of CCG and host of CCG Global Dialogue Series. You are watching Forum Online program advancing the 2030 agenda in uncertain times, sustainability and quest for the China-US cooperation, featuring the Honorable Secretary Henry Paulson and uh, also Mr. Wang Shi. Uh, Mr. Paulson served as the 74th Secretary of the Treasury under the President George W. Bush from July 2006 to January 2009. As a Treasury Secretary, Paulson led the nation's response to the financial crisis in 2008, helping to stabilize the global financial system and avoid the Second Great Repression. He also designed a strategic economic dialogue to revitalize the way US-China relations was conducted, achieving major breakthroughs on current manipulations, on currency manipulations, trade flows and environment, and global financial stability. Prior to that, Mr. Paulson had a 32 years career at Goldman Sachs, serving as a chairman and CEO beginning in 1999. As a banker, he grew the Goldman Sachs presence in China. Today, he is the chairman of Paulson Institute, which aims to foster a US-China relation that maintains global order in a rapidly evolving world. In 2021, Paulson helped launch and become the executive chairman of TPG Rise Climate, the climate involved investing platform of global private equity firm TPG. His leadership of TPG Rise Climate reflect his belief that there is an urgent need to accelerate action against the climate change and that innovative vehicles for private sectors financing will be essential for meeting the challenges. Mr. Paulson is also co-chair of the Epson Institute Economic Strategic Group co-chair of the advisory board of a Bloomberg Deal Economy Forum. He also chairs a number of uh, leading environment NGOs, including the Nature Conservancy Board of Directors and its Asia Pacific Council. Also, Mr. Paulson is the author of two bestsellers. One, the, uh, the one is that On the Blink and Dealing with China. The other book is Dealing with China. She is also the co-author of two books with former chair of uh, Federal Reserve Bank, Bernanke and former Secretary, Secretary Tim Geithner. Uh, so I would like to also introduce Mr. Wang Shi. Mr. Wang Shi is a senior vice chair of the Center for China and Globalization, CCG. He's the house name in China. He founded the Wanke in 1984 during a period when China's private economy barely started to develop. Under his leadership, Wanke grow, has grown into the world's largest residential property and developer by sales revenue and, and also is the pioneer of China green home construction. A devoted the environmental conservationist and practitioner of CSR, Mr. Wang Su has also created and led many influential environmental advocacy groups and charity organization. Chief of the, among them is the Society of Entrepreneurs and Ecological, known as SEE. He had been involved in global climate governance since 2009, having practiced in the United Nations Climate Change, participated in the United Nations Climate Change Conference and other programs. In 2013, he was elected the first Chinese board of director of World Wildlife Fund. From 2011 on, he studied the business and ethics across the cultural research at the University of the West uh, in the West, actually, in Harvard, I know that <laughs> I was there at the same time, and become a visiting scholar uh, also at the Cambridge and Hebrew University. Mr. Wang is widely known in China for his passion for mountain, mountain climbing. He lit literally set the trends for scaling Mount Everest and Arctic and, and Antarctic expedition in China. Mr. Wang is the author of five books. So, Secretary Paulson and Mr. Wang are all dedicated to conservationists and both are leading a, a financial and a philanthropic course to address the climate change and biodiversity bio diversity loss, biodiversity loss. With less than 10 years left to achieve the 2030 agenda for sustainable development goals, the world needs to pick up the peace 
pace and also put great efforts in finding the better solutions. The environment agenda, which is core to the SDGs, will depend critically on the ability of the world's two largest economies, the United States and China, to find a path towards partnership on climate action and ecological conservation. In less than 60 minutes, we're going to tap into their insights on sustainability issues, climate finance, and US-China cooperation. So without a further ado, let me turn to Secretary Paulson first. Uh, Mr. Paulson is joining us from Chicago on the evening of June 19th, Happy Father's Day. So probably, uh, 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 Hank, you can have your open <laughs> statement. Welcome to CCG Dialogue. Okay, so Dr. Wong, I want to first make sure you can hear me. Yes. I could hear you coming in and out sometimes more clearly than others. But if you can hear me, let me say how delighted I am to see you again and to be on a program with my good friend Wang Sha. I'm a big admirer of Wang Sha and have uh, enjoyed working with him over many years. Now, in terms of the Paulson Institute, when I set this up in 2011, I set up an independent think and do tank with the idea of sparking innovation, creativity, economic policy changes, environmental policies changes to help uh, promote a sustainable economic growth in a cleaner environment around the world. And my focus was on US China because I believe then, even though the relationship isn't as, wasn't as troubled as it is today, I believe then, as I believe now, that this is the most consequent relationship in the world. And here we're talking about the two biggest economies, the two biggest carbon emitters, energy users. And to me, if we're gonna make progress in these areas, it's important that we find ways to work in, you know, work in complementary ways. And so again, the Paulson Institute was focused on pooling ideas from both countries, developing solutions that would help lead to uh, advance economic growth and economic policy and a cleaner environment in both countries. Now, you, you cited the Paulson Prize, and that's one of our initiatives. And here, the Paulson Prize is designed to identify in China innovative, scalable uh, uh, programs that can promote uh, the sustainable urbanization and a clean environment. And I think we've done a pretty good job of developing best in class programs. And here, again, the focus is on helping for China's uh, transition to a sustainable, uh, cleaner economy. And we focus the prize in two areas, which is uh, green energy, you know, green energy, and a, a focus on uh, conservation uh, stewardship, a nature stewardship. And so th th that's a quick, uh, quick overview. And uh, again, it's something that's uh, very important to us. Thank you, Hank. Uh, that's great. I mean, that's a great start of your uh, introduction of the uh, Paulson Institute. We know that uh, actually CCG has supported the uh, Paulson Prize for sustainability in, in the past years. And uh, I was actually at a award ceremony held at Bloomberg's New Economy Forum in 2019 in Beijing, and you were there. And uh, so CCG is very pleased to become a partner of, of, of this program last year as well. So it's great to see both of you. And uh, so uh, I know you are the mastermind behind this uh, prize. And uh, of course, Mr. Wang is a member of his jury committee. So I understand that you both recently met in Chicago. So, so maybe I can tell us how did the synergy come about? Uh, so, 
So, Mr. Wang, you are in Europe right now. Uh, this is a very uh, great uh, journey uh, in uh, Greek. Uh, this is uh, four o'clock in the morning, your local time, and you. Paulson. The Paulson uh, found and also the relative activities for the sustainable development. You are also uh, one member of the panel of the judges for that prize. So, please uh, share with us. Uh, your synergy and also your recent activities. Thank you. So uh, having this chance to meet with uh, Mr. Bolson online is very valuable. It's fair to say that in uh, May, in early May, I embarked on my journey in uh, Europe. And this uh, journey is um, actually a journey from started from US, from Washington, D.C. to Chicago, Boston, and all the way to New York on a vessel, actually, and I'm still on the way. And so right now I'm in Athens. And uh, yes, for Athens, yes, yeah, so this is uh, the cradle, one of the cradles for civilizations of human beings. And right now, here I am, I'm in Greek. And uh, this is also the place with uh, very popular activities on can, uh, canals. And it's going to last to the end of July. And this is a very important stop. Uh, US is very important uh, stop. After Washington DC, uh, there is another stop that I'm going to come by in Chicago. And uh, there are five lakes and uh, the connection of the five lakes and the canals, uh, that's going to be a very splendid journey as well. From journey uh, from uh, New York, and uh, New York is one of the biggest ports in US and also one of the biggest financial centers in the world as well. And uh, I was attending uh, several environmental protection and conservation activities and conferences in uh, Boston and one arrangement is uh, for the, the speedboats racing and also visited the homes of um, uh, Henry Paulson and also uh, it impressed me a lot. That memory impressed me a lot. So uh, the beginning moments of uh, meeting with uh, Henry Paulson is uh, also very impressive. About 18 years ago, it was about 2004. Uh, at that time, Henry Paulson is uh, the CEO and the chairman of uh, Goldman Sachs and a very influential uh, financial leader. And I am also a leader uh, in the delegation of the businessmen of US, uh, of uh, China. And SEE is the organization I set up. In terms of the mental protection and conservation, well, uh, both of us have a great passion. But of course, we are still lack of experiences. In terms of the teamwork, we also are very late starter. So we signed uh, the strategic agreement with the TNC led by Henry Paulson. I still remember that was uh, in the Great Hall of People in China. And this was actually the official first moment or first time we met with each other. We didn't uh, talk much. What impressed me most is that uh, at that time, at Wall Street, investment uh, bankers are not were not very focused on green technology or environmental protection or ESG. However, Mr. Paulson was very much focused on that. Uh, and uh, uh, that impressed me a lot because he was both a financier and an environmentalist. And over the years, we have been working together with TNC and our group has grown from 100 business people to over 1,000. And we've learned a lot about environmental protection and uh, ecology and NGO governance. And in China, Close uh, to 1,000 uh, NGOs have been supported by us, and ICE has become a large environmental foundation in China. 
Uh, having said that, I'd like to talk about myself. In 2002, I was uh, mountaineering and I went to the highest peak in Africa and I didn't see any snow on that peak. Actually, it should be uh, snow capped, but I didn't see any snow. The conclusion I got was climate change and global warming. It is not just that peak. I also went to the South Pole and North Pole, not as cold as I expected. I remember that when I traveled to the South Pole, we uh, stayed for 20 minutes without any clothes on my back. And since then, I've decided to do environmental protection. And I participated in large global NGO activities. And uh, uh, Mr. Paulson is always there. And we know that uh, in the United States, there are some large NGO organizations. And uh, um, Mr. Paulson is the person that can connect those large NGOs together in the United States. So you asked me how I met Mr. Paulson. He said that uh, he set up the Paulson Institute in 2011. At that time, I was a director of WEF and uh, some large US NGOs uh, went to the Paulson Institute in Chicago to coordinate their activities. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Wang Shi for your very impressive story and your meeting with Mr. Paulson and uh, uh, both of you getting involved in environmental actions. Uh, it, seems, uh, it seems that uh, that's a very good case for US and Chinese entrepreneurs getting involved in environment. So what I'm saying is actually, uh, Hank, uh, according to the uh, UN 2022 Asian uh, and the Pacific Sustainable Development Goal Progress Report. At the current rate of change, none of the 17 SDG uh, objectives uh, will be achieved in all five sub-regions. So from your experience working in climate action and biodiversity, what are the possible solutions to this? Uh, I actually, I mean, you've been advocate, advocating for economically and environmentally beneficial market solutions to decarbonization. What is the role of private sector in responding to the climate change? What role uh, should the financial institution play? Actually, you know, like uh, uh, I was also talking to uh, Larry Summers, he was saying the World Bank, I mean, uh, AIB, ADB, all the other banks could play more roles. So what do you think of the private sector financial institution roles? There's a lot of discussion about the role of the private sector. <laughs> to me, climate change is the major predictable crisis that our planet faces. And this can only be solved if government and the private sector work together, right? Governments can do research on climate, they can set policy, but only the private sector can implement those policies, roll them out in scale, only the private sector. And so let's, let's start with the private sector. It, it seems to me that the, 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 the private sector, there's a number of things. First of all, financial institutions need to do a better job of developing climate financing techniques and models. They can do stress tests. I think financial institutions need to disclose the impact, right? Positive and negative impact on climate. So that, that is, that's pretty clear in terms of that. Venture capital can do a lot of work in terms of develop breakthrough technologies and get them ready to scale. That's pretty clear. The 
also private equity firms. I'm the executive chairman of a TPG private equity firm, and they can put capital behind uh, climate solutions that are proven to accelerate the development of those. But you, you need to begin with the fact that, that private can't do it without the government policies. It's going to take trillions and trillions of dollars that governments don't have. That money needs to come from the private sector, correct? And it's not a sustainable model for the private sector to make loans or investments that are going to make losses. So the, the government needs to create the regulatory environment. I agree with Dr. Summers. That one of the biggest things that needs to be done is to reform the multilateral development banks and the Bretton Woods institutions. But there, the governments need to come together and change the charter so that these institutions have the financial resources and the technical resources and the, the legal framework it takes to do the work that they need to do. So what I would say right now sector is well ahead of governments and that there's a lot of ambition in the private sector, but if we talk too much about private sector, it takes the focus on what needs to be done because governments need the political will to put the policies in place that are going to let the private sector be successful. Great. Thank you, Hank. You, you made a lot of uh, great initiatives. I think that uh, has been uh, very uh, uh, dedicated to this thing. I, I, I think that uh, uh, we need uh, global business leaders uh, and, you know, uh, uh, financial leaders and, as you said, government to really all work together, uh, uh, NGOs uh, combined to really achieve this uh, uh, sustainable uh, development consensus and also efforts to that. Now I'd like to talk to uh, Wang Shi. Okay, uh, Mr. Wang, last year uh, you went to COP26 in Glasgow. So what is uh, your biggest uh, takeaway in this uh, conference? So, for example, the uh, low carbon economy, what is your take on the carbon neutral economy in terms of how such economy benefit both business and environment? So it's fair to say that uh, last year in COP26 in Glasgow, I was attending that conference and I also for the first time organized the uh, executives or senior executives of Chinese businesses. And from 2009 all the way to 2019, I was um, um, organizing the uh, businessmen on behalf of China's uh, businessmen to attend uh, the China's uh, conference in Glasgow, uh, in the COP, in the COP conferences, including Glasgow conference of last year. It's fair to say that it's a very great achievement and a lot of takeaways. And um, the number of the uh, conferences and the meetings of the COP26 regarding China is increasing year by year. So with the China senior uh, managers, uh, the conversation was very good and uh, we reached consensus among us. And uh, the COP26 is uh, the conference with uh, the biggest number of the attendees, about uh, 25,000 attendees attending the conference in Glasgow. And this is uh, in the official meeting. And after the meeting, there's also a lot of activities uh, surrounding the COP26. It's fair to say that every day we would see uh, numerous meetings and uh, conversations uh, being held, uh, also including China's uh, delegations and uh, activities. And also a lot of attention has been spared to China as well. That is my uh, impression and my biggest impression or left the biggest impression to me for the 12 uh, past years. And uh, last year, due to the COVID, we have to get COVID test every day. And uh, all the organizations and uh, countries, uh, delegations are very passionate about the conference. And uh, on the COP26, a uh, tropical forest protection delegate, uh, declaration was launched. And uh, we want to wait and see for the final achievements and uh, how this uh, declaration end up. And uh, we need to see uh, how actions were uh, taken in, instead of just uh, lip services. 
And at the same time, we feel that although we know there's a lot of um, uh, imperative issues in front of us, but still we have to strike the balance of the different uh, interests and also uh, the interest of the different stakeholders. So the agreement reached by uh, all stakeholders is very difficult. Uh, nobody knows what will come uh, until the last minute. So this is a really a valuable and a hard earned declaration in the end. For example, US and China and EU, uh, the uh, conversations and explorations on the future solutions for cooperation is uh, always continued. And so without the participation by either one of them, there's no speak of the collaboration in the end for the climate issues and many other issues related to this. But still, I'm very positive about this um, um, outcome. China's businesses and China's businessmen or entrepreneurs of China, they also have expressed their feelings and opinions in uh, the COP26, and they have shared the stories of the four decades of reform and opening of China. And in the first two decades, China was uh, mainly featured by the fast development or the high growth rate of the economy. And so that has been acknowledged by the world. And in the second two, decade, uh, two decades, uh, activities of um, low carbon development were also initiated and embarked on. So the private businesses and initiated the journey and the uh, state-owned enterprises initiated their own journey and they combined their journeys together. And uh, MNCs and private sectors and public sectors, uh, they combined their efforts together. And uh, that's why uh, the environmental conservation and the natural con con uh, conservation uh, have achieved a lot of uh, achievements. At the same time, the government and the private uh, companies and the public uh, companies, uh, they have to join hands together, just uh, being alluded to by Mr. Henry Paulson, that the passion and also the endeavors need to be uh, generated, and they also, the, especially from the private uh, enterprises. So uh, the uh, consensus and also the declaration and achievements reached by all stake, uh, stakeholders and governments in a UNFCCC COP conference is very important especially on the climate summit and also in the uh, climate uh, related uh, conference China need to demonstrate its own features and also demonstrate its own achievements uh, as a demonstrative to other countries and also uh, we also need to have other countries to know our own features and traditions um, as a foundation for further collaboration between each other. So I think more and more we will see opportunities like this. On the other hand, uh, China's uh, NGO also continue becoming stronger and stronger. We have witnessed uh, their strength on COP26 as well. In the past, the uh, NGO's participation was not that strong, but on this COP26, so we have seen a very strong participation and endeavor made by the NGOs of China, and that they become more and more influential. And the third positive takeaway is that uh, the youngsters are the future of uh, all kinds of endeavors. We have also seen the uh, jointly launched the uh, United uh, Coalition of uh, Universities, a sort of like this, have been launched uh, last year. And this is uh, also very important to demonstrate the uh, strength of the youngsters from this um, young graduates from the universities as well. We have also seen the organizations uh, organized by the university students and the scholars, young scholars, and they made a lot of speeches on the COP26 conferences as well. And uh, we have had the activities both online and offline participated by a lot of young scholars and students from universities and colleges. I think the journey ahead of us are full of bumps and China is also have a long way to go. The 2030 carbon peaking and 2060 carbon neutrality, the dual carbon goals are in front of us, which is very arduous. And China's 2060 and other advanced countries are normally 2050, 10 years uh, left behind. Probably we can uh, set the deadline a little bit earlier than schedule. But I think 
2060 is uh, the realistic deadline. Even 2060 is very arduous for us. But on the COP 2060, uh, 26, China's delegates have made uh, the commitments that we would try our best before 2060, carbon neutrality will be attained by China. And this is a realistic target and we'll try our best to attain that target. So I think this is really good uh, environment created by all delegations. And this is also very positive to push forward and promote the future initiative. And China's NGOs and China's organizations played a very big role. As for my participation, uh, on my part, I've expressed that I not only on behalf of my uh, company, my group, Banco, but also I'm on behalf of uh, the different sectors and industry of China, like real estate sector, real estate or housing sector is uh, account for more than 10% of the carbon emissions in manufacturing. Uh, in terms of the building materials for the commercial buildings or residential buildings and the school buildings and all kinds of buildings, the carbon emission in the building materials account for even bigger about 30 to 35 percent of the total urban development compared to advanced countries. Uh, this is a little bit bigger. So although this uh, chunk is very big, still we are on the way to abate it. On COP26 conference, we made it very clear that we are going to make very clear plan and also clear targets to attain before 20, uh, before COP26 and express it on 26, uh, 27. And right now we are on the way of uh, the uh, carbon abatement in urban development in the building of those infrastructures and the housings. So COP26 is not only the demonstration of uh, actions, but also the commitment that we are going to prepare for 27, COP27, and we are going to launch our plan in the near future. Thank you. See you yeah, uh, I can hear you now. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I can see what uh, 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 Mr. Wang just uh, said. Uh, uh, you know, the, the very important is to have, uh, you know, private sector and business sector, government, I mean, to work together uh, to achieve this, uh, 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 sustainable uh, uh, environment uh, uh, objectives, of course, so, uh, carbon neutral. So, so, so you, uh, Mr. Wang, you emphasized the, the importance of business, government, and uh, uh, of course, also NGO. So that's a great example of uh, what you have experienced at the COP26. And what I think actually is very, very useful is that uh, uh, you also mentioned about business, uh, uh, you know, mobilization. I mean, you know, they have to do that. I mean, China is now uh, the business sector, for example, clean energy vehicle, Tesla is, is doing fabulous in China, uh, you know, wind, wind, wind power, uh, you know, solar power, you know, all those things that China uh, is, is leading probably, uh, you know, world to some extent. But also you mentioned about the uh, real estate sector where uh, Wang Ke is, is a big, uh, one of the largest uh, developer, real estate developer in China. And actually, you know, you, you mentioned about there's 30, 40% that uh, carbon emission could be done uh, be saved as uh, through the real estate development. So, so that's really a uh, great uh, stuff uh, to, to talk about. Now, I'd like to talk to uh, Secretary Paulson now. And uh, you know, the biggest uh, challenge actually for achieving uh, 2030 agenda today li lies actually in our fragment fragmented. Yeah, Dr. Wong, I can hear you again. You're cutting in and out. Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now, uh, Hank? Can you hear me now? I can hear that, right. Okay, great. So what I would I like to uh, talk to you now is that uh, the biggest challenge actually uh, for achieving the 2030 agenda today lies in the in our fragmented multilateral system. It is unfortunate that the United States and China, particularly the two the world's two largest economies, are locked in in this tense strategic uh, 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 you know competition, where it's also. <laughs> Uh, you know, Secretary Blinken recently mentioned the uh, competition as well. So, 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 Mr. President, you you mentioned about economic eye curtain speech, uh, really uh, drive the message home uh, uh, some time ago. So, climate change is the area of U.S.-China cooperation that holds really potential. And uh, and both John, uh, you know, uh, uh, Secretary John Kerry and uh, Minister Xie Zhenghua, you know, the two climate envoy by both President Xi and President Biden. 
uh, has uh, you know spoke each other at the Davos and the COP26 and actually reached agreement. Uh, John Kerry actually even attended our <laughs> our meeting at the Security Conference about two years ago at the CCG. So, so what do you think? I mean, how the U.S. and China relation go forward? I mean, what are the possible paths for cooperation for the two countries amongst competition? But then there's a climate change. There's a finance uh, uh, crisis, a recession, you know, high inflation, uh, you know, people to people exchange, global development. So, so what's your overall assessment, you know, for the sign of U.S. cooperation, and what are the challenges we have to face? Thanks. Okay, uh, Dr. Wong, I think I got part of that. So let me begin by saying, I think there's no doubt that our two countries are strategic competitors. And I think we're competitors across really all of the domains, you know, technology, uh, finance, uh, economy, uh, military, and ideology. <clears throat> but despite that, our two countries have the common goals. We have some shared interests. We need to have peace, stability, world order, a stable climate right and so we have we have shared goals and so the question is how can we cooperate at the same time we compete and you know I, I think there's a number of areas that are important you know citizen to citizen exchanges are very important I mean the work that Wang Xia and I have done over the years what I found even though I a very different culture and political system. The Chinese and American people like each other. We have a national unity for each other. And I think some of it has been hampered by COVID, right? I haven't been able to travel to China since 2019. Uh, many uh, business people that were in China America, have come back as a result of COVID. So I think that's important. Climate change obviously is another area and that is an area that our two presidents have designated as an area where we should work together. We've got groups working together on, you know, on, on methane and uh, and on other things in it, it, as climate. I, I think this is made more difficult by the competitive relationship and uh, you know what I consider to be a fraught relationship. But as I think about the areas where we should be working together. And I think it's it's important to both countries that we do this and, and to the whole world because we are the biggest climate emitters, right? China is by far the biggest emitter of carbon emissions. And the US has only 4% of the world's population, but 11 to 12% of carbon emissions, right? And so both countries have got a, a real need to work together. And so here's the areas I here's what I think we should be doing. First, we both should be doing more research and developing the breakthrough technologies we're going to need to avoid climate disaster and some of the harder technologies we need to do. So that, that is clearly an area we, we should work together. I think we both should work on lifting and eliminating tariffs on environmental goods or services makes no sense to charge tariffs on environmental goods and services, right? To make economic sense, doesn't make ethical sense to pay more for the environmental goods and services we need. We can cooperate more. We each need to provide incentives to channel private sector money into developing and rolling out in scale the technologies that we need to reduce carbon emissions. I think we both can do more to share technologies and make sure that we deploy the key technologies in each of our countries. This may require some concession on both of our government's part, but I think that's very important. I, I, I think, so we need to develop clean technologies. And I, I think we need to, to really work to accelerate the reduction of carbon emissions in emerging nations. Each of us can do that, right? Just looking at the brick and roads countries, they're responsible for 28% of carbon emissions today, 
But by 2050, it could be 60% if we don't do something so we can work there. And lastly, I'm gonna come back to the point that you mentioned that Larry Summers said, which is, you know, when we look at carbon governance, global carbon governance, because, you know, to me, it was inspiring, really inspiring to hear what Wang Xie was doing and, and everything China was doing and Wang Xie has done Glasgow. That's very, very necessary, but it's not sufficient, right? So right now we are, even if we met the Glasgow targets, the globe would overheat and we're not coming, we're not even close to being on a path to meet those targets, right? And so I think we need a different approach to climate governance. And we're not gonna get anywhere unless we see the US, China, India, the other big countries doing more, doing more at the governmental level to, to incentivize industry. So there's a lot we can do. One area where we can work on together is, well, you know, on the Belt and Road, for instance, and uh, the Paulson Institute, my institute is working with the Green Principles. We were the first U.S. NGO to join into that effort, to work with to set green development principles for the, for, for the Belt and Road. I think in working with multilateral development banks, the Paulson Institute is working with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank which are doing some very interesting things there. But I think all multilateral development banks and the Bretton Woods institutions need to do more. And we're not gonna do more unless the governments come to come together to give them the capacity and the financial support they need. And so this is an area where US and China and you know, the other major countries of the world need to cooperate and work together. So there's a lot to be done. I've got to be honest in saying there's not nearly as much being done as should be being done. And that has to do with, you know, the strategic competition and the, the, the nature of the, the fraught relationship between our two countries. But I come back again to say there's nothing wrong with admitting we're strategic competitors and we're competing in all these areas. But we also need to acknowledge both countries have shared goals. We need peace, we need prosperity, we need a, a global order that works, and we need a, to save our planet because climate change is a threat not only to economic security, but global stability and life on earth that we know it. So I, I believe that we have a saying in the US that necessity is a mother of invention, right? And, and I happen to believe that necessity is gonna bring our countries together and again, I look forward to the day when we can travel freely and I can visit China and we can have more uh, interpersonal relations. Because the reason I set up, part of the reasons I set up the Paulson Institute is I knew there are going to be tough times between our governments, Beijing and, and Washington, D.C. Now, I didn't predict it was going to be as tough as it is now, but there are going to be tough times. And I think we need other linkages people-to-people -people linkages, economic linkages, NGOs working together, people working together to, to solve. And that's why I think the work that Wang Xia did, bringing the big delegation from China to Glasgow to interact with all the other leaders around the world is so essential. So I say thank you to Wang Xia. Great, great. Thank you, uh, Hank. Uh, you, you're absolutely right. I think uh, we need the multiple linkages and uh, and uh, exchanges and uh, you know dialogues like this, and particularly face-to-face -face dialogues that we hope that you can uh, come uh, you know as soon as uh, as we we lifted all those uh, uh, you know yeah. uh, the quarantines. And uh, so 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 you mentioned about you know this uh, this critical uh, uh, component of cooperation between uh, uh, China and U.S. I mean, you particularly I I, I highly uh, support your idea. You know, on a tariff for those environmental uh, sustainable development uh, products, we should really give them, a, a, you know, a, a lift the tariff uh, 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 sanctions. Particularly now we are facing such a high inflation. I mean, uh, also the food crisis, energy crisis, uh, Ukraine, uh, Russian conflict. Uh, you know, I mean, I think now uh, probably we're, we're seeing a report, probably. Uh, uh, President yeah, no, I, I was talking about 
So that's a different issue. And I think the US government is looking at reducing those tariffs. I've said from the beginning that those tariffs don't make economic sense, not good for either country, and, uh, and is a tax on US consumers and it is not good for trade. But I was making a different point. I was making a point that there have been longstanding tariffs on environmental goods and services. And there, I think China needs to do more because when we've tried to, to, to get people together and, and, and at the WTA and do things with the WTO and elsewhere to lift environmental goods and uh, tariffs on environmental goods and services, there China has been resistant to eliminating those tariffs. So I think there's more we can do in these areas. And I, I, I know they're politically complex, and I know that the competition and economic competition make it more complicated, but I think that the, uh, the, the fight to save our planet is more important. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we, we need to do both uh, on both sides. I mean, leave tariff on, uh, you know, China, U.S. should do all the same. I mean, that's a great, uh, great, uh, uh, I think, the, the statement that you, you, we made uh, here. Uh, but also you mentioned about uh, this uh, uh, green and uh, belt and road. I mean, uh, that, that's very interesting. You have, you have helping setting the green standard uh, on that. And, and also Biden has proposed B3W, there's a BI, there's a, uh, you know, EU global gateway. I mean, infrastructure, I mean, green infrastructure are probably the need for the future. And we should probably all work together on that. that oh, yeah. Find something together to work on. That's, that's extremely important because the world needs hundreds of billions of dollars, maybe trillions of dollars in infrastructure. But how that, and no NGO likes to see infrastructure. You know, they've never seen a dam they like, they never see a road they like, never seen a railroad they like, never seen an oil well, but they all can be done in ways while there's less damage on the environment. And that's another area of the Paulson Institute is look to work with, with, with organizations. And I think every development bank, including the China Development Bank, the XM Bank, all the development banks can do a better job of planning in advance, right? Rather than writing impact statements after the, the project has already been done to harm the environment, the plan and to figure out how to build the infrastructure so as to do as little damage as possible to the environment. And you know, we haven't talked much about the biodiversity crisis, but I see the biodiversity crisis as being every bit as alarming as the climate crisis because the two of them go together, but the climate crisis is accelerating the biodiversity and vice versa. And we're seeing species extinction on Earth at a thousand times the natural rate. So at this rate, 50 of the all species on earth would be extinct by 2050. And so in many ways, this is even more alarming than climate change because with climate change, we understand the science behind it, right? And we understand what we need to know. But in terms of, uh, of disrupting mother nature, we don't even know what we don't know. And so I think it's alarming. And so there, the key thing we not need to do is protect the environment and not destroy it. And we can do some simple things that the financial institutions do and in terms of our ag subsidiaries and fishing and, and timbering uh, it, it, it subsidies in those areas. So there's a lot we can do. China has done a lot in China, you know, an awful lot with a cleaner China. I think there's a potential for China to do more outside of China looking at the biodiversity, but there's a potential for all of us to do more. And so this is, a, again, another area um, that, that where, where there's a global crisis, which I hope really brings people together. And I think COVID has led people to focus more on mother nature, right? And uh, so I think that may be an, an, an incentive. But again, this is an area where Wang Xia has been a real leader and the work that he and his foundation have done in terms of restoring mangroves, for instance, which are vital to the, to the ecosystem, protecting coastlines and, and nurseries for fishes and so on. And so he also 
been a leader in this area in China, and we've been pleased and honored to uh, to, to work with him uh, within China on biodiversity conservation. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, thank you, Hank, for for excellent uh, remarks. Absolutely, I mean the the the, the cooperation between China, U.S. on on all those. Uh, uh, development banks, infrastructure, and biodiversity are uh, absolutely crucial. Uh, so, so thank you uh, again for that. And and actually, my my staff was telling me uh, we're almost closing, but uh, uh, but we actually had uh, you know multiple channels online, almost half a million uh, viewers uh, uh, that tuned into our, our dialogue. So, so to conclude, I would like to have uh, uh, both Wang Shi and and uh, uh, Hank for your for your closing uh, remarks. You know. Uh, how can we, you know, particularly from business community, uh, uh, NGO sectors, can we work together between China and the U.S. on those common challenges in the face in the world? And how can we work better? I mean, China and the U.S. in terms of uh, you know, those common challenges facing uh, humankind, climate change and the biodiversity, and of course, uh, 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 you know, all those future uh, 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 the catastrophe. I mean, economic, uh, you know, recession. So, so perhaps once you can, can conclude that, and I'll have uh, uh, Secretary Paulson to, to conclude uh, after you. Uh, Wang Shi, you can hear me? Thank you. Uh, yeah, listening to the presentation uh, made by Mr. Henry Paulson, I uh, felt the same thing regarding how to better facilitate the uh, cooperation and collaboration between US and China in the future for the common challenges faced by human beings. As uh, a leader of NGO and a leader in the business uh, community in China, I think um, after China joined her WTO, China has been regarded as um, a market which was open. And at the same time, China is also a very important bridge between the different uh, streams of uh, the flow of the commodities and the services. So as a businessman from the business environment, it's fair to say that from the beginning of reform and opening up all the way to now, across the whole systems of the finance, the commodities development and the trade in everything, we have seen the uh, interrelated world between you and me, between different countries and different stakeholders. Well, actually, after 50 years of journey uh, of this visit, be it in the uh, US or Europe, the uh, MNCs or the uh, companies or SMEs having relations with uh, China's enterprises, especially the SMEs is very important because MNCs, so you don't have to talk too much about it. They have their organization to operation in China already. But for SMEs of uh, other countries, so their relation with the China's businesses is really valuable, especially against the background of COVID, against the background of the current challenges. In the supply chain, especially, we have seen the uh, blocking and the disruptions during this years. So um, it's a really hard, very hard time. And like the business of China, for them, it's very hard to get out. And for those business in other countries, it's very hard to them to get in China. So from the emotional perspective, or from the business perspective, it's really hard times. The connection is very important. And we have felt a lot of disruptions in the connections between each other. So the conflict does not come from uh, the uh, trade barriers or the tariffs or the trade conflicts, not that uh, it's uh, the COVID, it's the pandemic. We have had the same expectation that after COVID is over, we can be connected and reconnected together. So, um, Everyone is um, actually prepared for that moment to come, couldn't wait for that moment to come. So after so many years of the connections, we, other countries, especially those uh, tourist, um, tourist countries that they have got used to uh, numerous Chinese visitors and uh, tourists coming to their uh, territories to visit, and they earn money uh, also in the end. And so right now, there's a lot of disruptions and a blockage of the travel, the ban in travel, uh, which lead to the disruptions of uh, their income in these tourist countries as well. So a lot of countries, uh, they really in e 
in uh, the great uh, need of China's investment. Uh, the international investment and international assistance in some developed, less developed countries is also very important. So we need to reopen. And uh, in terms of, for example, the clean energies development, like the wind power development of batteries and the energy storage, and we have felt uh, that this country is in need of China's investment collaboration and the China's um, companies to come and to uh, reside over there to cooperate with them. So the climate is becoming warmer. This is one issue. Cooperation is very necessary and is a must. And this must actually is, expand, is beyond uh, the need for uh, conflicts. We have to join hands and we have to uh, set aside the conflicts of the interest. Like Paulson has said that, the uh, um, biodiversity conservation is uh, equally important as climate change issues. I agree with them. And we have to keep humble as a human beings in front of the nature, in front of the uh, biological environment, because we are yet to know the full picture of the influence or impact of the climate change to biodiversity. And we have to uh, wait and see, and we have to take initiative in uh, preserve the nature in advance, so no matter what happened in the end. And also we have to explore the common way to, or the common solutions to protect the biodiversity, which can benefit all of us, especially COVID, after COVID. So the biggest imperative of uh, humanity, I feel, is the initiative taken by China, US and the EU countries for common development and a common prosperity. But I think the three, party, three parties are the most important. US, China, and the EU, these are the three most important uh, force for NGOs. So uh, cooperation is also the core issue for them. And above which we have to set aside uh, the impact from the COVID and so we have to reconnect with each other. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Wang, so you, you mentioned it very well. I think that's very important to have uh, uh, these exchanges uh, between the business, between the people and travel, you know, outbound tourists from China, uh, all those good things that uh, I think are really needed uh, to, to really, uh, you know, keep the bridges and, uh, and, and flow. Uh, so, so uh, Secretary Paulson, your last word and uh, how is U.S.-China business and uh, to... <laughs> Uh, government and also uh, with other countries to work together for facing the common challenges. Yeah, so I won't repeat a lot of the things I, I said earlier. Uh, I'll begin with the governments. And I, I really do think that uh, I say much about governments because I think unfortunately our, our, our governments are uh, communicating. It's good that they're communicating there's communication at, at, at a senior level, but there's a lot of communication that isn't taking place. And, uh, and so I think at the government level, I just recommend that they do things together uh, that are simpler and easier to learn so we can, so we can build on success. And, uh, you know, those are the, the, the communication, perhaps the strategic and military area, to, to avoid conflict, uh, very important uh, communication from the macroeconomic policies. There's one thing that this recent period has pointed out is this great irony. Just at the time that there's more trouble between our two countries, more competition, uh, more fraught relationship, it's clear and clear how interdependent we are. If there are issues in China, economic problems or, or COVID lockdowns, it impacts what happens in the US economy. If there's something in the US economy, it impacts China. If we have another global financial crisis, wherever where it'll start, it will impact both countries. So we, we sure need communications about macroeconomic policy at a senior level. And then I think climate change I outlined all the things that should be done. We know those things aren't going to be done right right now. They're just not. So realistically, we have to do some simple things. The working group, you know, that's been set up with with John Kerry and his counterpart. 
if, you know, working on methane or whatever the issues are. And so to get some simpler things done. And then I come back to the private sector because I can be very negative. Even if I get outside of Goldman Sachs, or excuse me, if I get outside of what's going on with the, between the United States and China and all uh, the conflict and, and fraught relationship, just looking at globally, we're not doing the things we need to do to meet the climate crisis. But the good news is what you see in the private sector, because what we've seen is due to a lot of innovation there, we've seen the cost of renewables come down so they're competitive, right? So in half the world economies, if you have scalable wind or solar, it's competitive with, and, and in many cases better than coal or, you know, or, or, or gas. And so we've seen that no, number one, and, and, and that's a big positive. And then what we're seeing is we're seeing financial institutions are, are putting pressure on uh, companies to take action. Their investors are, and their customers are. The people are, the American people, the Chinese people around the world want to see progress. And so businesses are innovating at a faster rate than I've ever seen. And I've probably talked in the last year with the CEOs of 80 global companies from all over the world. And if I talked with those companies two or three years ago, they'd say, oh yeah, we're the best at environment and climate change. Talk to my sustainability officer. I want to talk to you about US-China relations or what's going on with the economy. Today, they're all focused on climate change. And so they're making progress. And so I think there, and uh, so I think the, there will be opportunities for cross investment in this area and for companies to, uh, to, to continue to make progress. And so th that's where it is. But right now, I think that there's going to be a limit to what we can do and to make a lot of progress as long as uh, the Russian uh, Ukraine, you know, Russia is continuing to invade Ukraine. So I think that's go going to be that's going to be, you know, that's doing a lot to disrupt the global economy. But, but overall, there's plenty of things we can do. And it's very good and applicable that you had Wang Xia on this discussion. I think a lot of what is going to be done is going to be done by the private sector. So thank you for this opportunity. And it's always good, you know, we can see some of the problems we've had even with technology today. But I look forward to the day when I can travel to China and see all my friends again and have face-to-face -face communications. And with my colleagues at the Paulson Institute, I had, a, I had a Zoom call with them again this Monday and thanked them for all the work our Chinese colleagues are doing in China, in Beijing and Shanghai. But I haven't seen them in person now in a couple of years. Okay, <laughs> great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh... Uh, Secretary Paulson, excellent. You, you said uh, at your closing remark. I think absolutely the government is is important. Uh, you know, they should increase the level of communication and and dialogue. Absolutely, so crucial. And you emphasize the business. I mean, business is crucial. I mean, yeah. uh, absolutely important uh, with all the multinationals, uh, uh, private sectors, SME, and all the NGOs. So, so that's great uh, message. You, uh, both of you have uh, you know outlined. Uh, today, uh, I really appreciate all the uh, great contribution you made. So that's all the time we have. We we actually we're going to conclude our special dialogue series uh, on, on at, uh, at eighth uh, the China Globalization Forum. We're, we're having another twenty ambassadors roundtable next. So so we have to stop here. I appreciate all your contributions. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.